In the world of entrepreneurship, we often glorify original ideas. But what if I told you that copying others is the ticket for most people to make millions? Today, we are talking about the riches that are out there for people who copy businesses and execute better than the competition. Many moons ago, when I was a young, bushy-tailed undergrad student, my roommate and I would hold occasional meetings where we would brainstorm business ideas that could, you know, make us billionaires. We tried to think of novel ideas, and as it turned out, that was really difficult. And after we'd spent enough time failing to identify our billion-dollar idea, the meeting would be over when one of us just blurted out, horse boat. Horse boat. Oh, a canoe built around your horse so you can go from riding to water travel without slowing down. One time though, we kind of caught hold onto an idea that seemed really promising. We talked about what the tech stack would need to be and what the marketing would look like, and we got real excited about it. And the next morning we told our other roommate our idea, and he quickly said something like, yeah, that's Apple TV. And yeah, well, that kind of sucked. It was a huge blow to our enthusiasm knowing that we had to go back to our second best idea of manufacturing horse boats. Well, that semester I took a class that was a series of lectures given by current entrepreneurs. One of the most memorable lectures was given by Josh James. Josh is an entrepreneur who started a web analytics company called Omniture, and when he came to give his lecture, he had recently sold Omniture to Adobe for 1.8 billion. Yeah, I know, pretty nice. At the end of telling his story and how Omniture came to be, he opened things up for some Q&A. And one of the students raised his hand and asked something like, every time I get excited about a business idea I come up with, I'll start doing research and find that someone else is already doing it. How can I get started when all my ideas are already being done? And Josh's response to that was an evergreen lesson in entrepreneurship. As you'd expect, he talked about how all those people out there already doing your idea are validation that there is a market that is willing to pay for that product or service. If you truly thought of a business idea that literally no one else is doing, then it's telling of one of three things. The first is that you're bad at researching. Someone is doing it, and that's pretty likely. The second possibility is that you are going to be filthy rich because you're the first person to think of this idea with a blue ocean, untapped market. And that one is pretty unlikely. And the third possibility is that the reason no one is doing it is because no one is willing to pay for it. There's no market for it. And that's most likely. Josh explained that most of the time, it's not our job as entrepreneurs to be novel and do something that's never been done before. It's really hard to do that and chances are you won't. Even if you did, there are problems that go along with being first to market. There's a common saying that goes something like, you can tell who the pioneers of an industry are because they're laying on the ground with arrows in their backs. The entrepreneur's job is to take an existing idea and work harder, work smarter, and beat the competition. Or in other words, fire off those arrows at the pioneers. As I've since internalized my takeaway of Josh's lecture, I could summarize it by saying that success in entrepreneurship is created by copying an idea, and as a side note, it's really nice if that idea is growing in popularity, and then adding to that idea enough incremental value to command market share. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you're liking this video, I would really appreciate you giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. Thank you, and let's get back to it. So let's take a classic example of this. We all remember Photolog, right? You know, that platform that allowed users to share their photos and write captions and interact with users via follows, comments, and messages. No, no one remembers Photolog because we all have Instagram. Can you imagine if Kevin Systrom, the founder of Instagram, woke up one day and decided he wanted to start a photo sharing social media platform. Maybe, I don't know, call it Instagram. And so he sits down to do some research and sees that there's a company, an established company called Photolog that had already been doing that for years. And then he just says, ah, dang, I guess I'll figure something else out. Well, I can tell you one thing, he probably wouldn't be worth the billions of dollars he is today. You see, Kevin wasn't deterred by a competitor. He understood that he could still enter the market and win if he could just identify the opportunities to improve the space. So let's take a deeper look into the Instagram example to illustrate this. When Kevin Systrom and Mike Krieger launched Instagram, the market was already crowded with photo sharing platforms. Photolog was there and so was Flickr, Photobucket, and even Facebook was already a dominant platform for sharing images. So what did Instagram do differently? Well, here are a couple of things. First of all, they hugely benefited from writing a massive trend taking place a couple years before Instagram launched. So let's go through this. Instagram launched in 2010. And what was happening just before then? Well, in 2007, Steve Jobs announced the launch of the iPhone. 
And now for those of you who weren't phone users during the dark ages before the iPhone, you really can't understand how much of a game changer the iPhone was. Before it, using your cell phone's internet was about as fun as it is to rip out your nose hairs. Typing a URL into your phone took like 10 minutes because of how many buttons you'd have to press. And then we only had primitive web browsers called WAP browsers that made every website look like it was designed by a toddler. It was really bad. But then all of a sudden the iPhone comes along and brings a good internet experience to mobile devices. Then in 2008, Apple launched its App Store, giving users access to internet content specifically made for mobile. Also in 2008, Google launched Android, and then in 2010, Apple launched the iPad. The release of all these products meant massive adoption of internet usage on mobile devices. Now when Instagram launched, they did so not just with a mobile first approach, but with a mobile only approach. Every aspect of Instagram's design, functionality, and user experience was made for mobile devices, whereas the competition at the time was scrambling to adapt their desktop-first applications to now new mobile platforms. Instagram capitalized on the massive adoption of mobile platforms and was able to create a better user experience because of it. But Instagram's success isn't only because they were mobile friendly. They took the time to understand and execute on what mobile users were really after a seamless and engaging photo sharing experience. This is where Instagram's filters came into play. While photo filters weren't new at the time, Instagram seamlessly integrated them into the user experience. You could take a picture, apply a filter, and post in like three taps on the phone. And the filters were high enough quality to compensate for the poor picture quality of early smartphones. And this helped to make Instagram users feel like skilled photographers and be excited about using the platform. Again, Instagram founders didn't reinvent any wheels here. Photo sharing wasn't new, filters weren't new, they copied these ideas, but they invested heavily in understanding how their version of those things could create a superior customer experience and then executed on that vision. And in 2012, only two years after they launched, Instagram was acquired by Facebook for $1 billion. So when you decide to jump into entrepreneurship, don't worry about being so genius as to invent a new product or service and create an entirely new market. The questions you should be asking are something like, what market is attractive to me? What businesses in that market are working well? And for which one of these ideas do I see the clearest path to improving customer experience? The better you can answer these questions and then execute against your vision, the clearer your path to success. So what markets are interesting to you and which businesses do you wanna copy? Let me know in the comments below and please subscribe to the channel. I'll see you next time.